introduce Dr. Isaac Josh Abacasis, who's a new neurosurgery faculty member. We are so fortunate to have you in the stroke program as well as in the neurosurgery program and uh, our, together our Neuroscience Institute. Um, basically, Dr. Abacasis got his BS in Bio en biomedical Engineering and Tissue Engineering at Northwestern, did his medical school training there and then went to University of Washington and uh, did neurosurgical residency with added training in cerebrovascular disease and skull base uh, work and then went to the University of Miami and finished a fellowship in endovascular treatment and University of Miami is really a friend of ours because many of our residents have done their vascular neurology training there and uh, it's uh, Dr. Sacco is an international figure and a great person and I'd like to just say one other thing that one of the neurology faculty members at the University of Miami sent me a letter unsolicited letting me know how collaborative uh, Dr. Abacasis is and how skilled he is. And so we've seen that already and it's great. Thank you for allowing us to have you talk to us about an overview of hemorrhagic stroke for our faculty residents and medical students. Thanks so much, Dr. Emil. Very kind introduction. I, I'm the lucky one to be here. It's, it's a great team to join and uh, thanks to Dr. Nemot for also supporting this initiative and everyone's been great. Um, I'm going to talk today about hemorrhagic stroke. It's a broad topic, so I'll try to touch on uh, some of the important uh, parts, but obviously not everything. Um, my disclosures are I do some consulting and have equity in a robotics company uh, that is uh, designing uh, a robot for endovascular mechanical thrombectomy, and then uh, I do some consulting for a catheter development company, but none of which are uh, relevant to today. Um, these are the CME codes I was asked to put sort of in the beginning and the end of the talk uh, for anyone who's using the, the, uh, the presentation for continuing medical education. Um, so here's an outline of, <clears throat> of the talk. We'll, I'll start with an overview of intracerebral hemorrhage and various definitions and categorizations. I'll spend a little bit more extra time on secondary uh, ICH, which I think is what we see on the neurosurgical side of things more common. Uh, than, than the primary, though potentially not for long. And, um, and then I, I was able to connect with uh, some of the fantastic research people in the stroke department um, to, uh, to, to look at some of the data that we have for University of Louisville and then compare it to kind of nationwide for, for ICH. And then finally, I'll kind of end the talk with uh, a focused discussion on um, ICH clot evacuation, some of the data supporting it and kind of where we're at. Uh, what the state of affairs is. Um, so to begin, I think it's important to define intracerebral uh, hemorrhage or ICH, and really I think it's composed of, of, of multiple different forms of, of uh, spontaneous uh, brain hemorrhage. And so um, there's intraparenchymal hematoma or hemorrhage or IPH, and if you look at the, the far right, that's the the part of the clot that's sort of labeled in green, and that's you know in the parenchyma of the brain, there's subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which at the far right is labeled red, and that occurs in the subarachnoid space. And then there's interventricular hemorrhage or IVH, um, which is labeled in purple. So you know collectively, ICH kind of represents uh, various different locations of blood. Um, predominantly, I think what I'll focus on today is is IPH, um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage or spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is a whole nother etiology, uh, as is interventricular hemorrhage, but oftentimes they come together. And, and you know, if you have an intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the thalamus, for example, um, it's very common for it to spill over into the third ventricle and cause interventricular hemorrhage. And then once it's in the ventricle, it can kind of recycle through and end up in the subarachnoid space. So it, it, it's just important to remember that ICH really represents um, a broad array uh, of different types of, of brain hemorrhage. And when we when we categorize ICH, I think um, the main way to do so is to think about it as either primary or secondary. Primary meaning, um, you know, there's not some other source that's causing the ICH. Um, 
There's a mnemonic called SMASH U that I think is helpful to kind of remember the different causes of ICH. Um, and I have that on the bottom, but essentially it can be structural vascular lesions. So that's sort of secondary causes, meaning there's something there with the blood vessels and that's wired wrong. And, that, you know, that, that's the reason that this bleed occurred. Medications, which is becoming more and more common um, as our uh, elderly are living longer and there's more medical comorbidities. So things like Coumadin and Apixaban and antiplatelet agents are more and more common. Um, and that is sort of grouped into the primary intracerebral hemorrhage in that there's not a lesion underneath, but, but, a, but you know, a problem with a lab or abnormality. Uh, amyloid angiopathy, which is a major cause of primary ICH. Uh, systemic disease, uh, hypertension, which is another major cause of primary ICH, and then um, undetermined. Sometimes it's, you know, idiopathic. Um, so looking at the schematic, you can see examples of two of the more common you know, the major causes of primary ICH, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is more commonly low bar and um, more distantly located versus a hypertensive um, ICH, which we see in um, characteristic deep structures of the brain. So the pons, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, and the thalamus are the common locations. If we look over at secondary ICH, you can see examples of different causes, you know, hemorrhagic tumor or an AVM. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these different um, uh, sort of some of these different uh, causes. Um, I won't talk today, but Moya Moya, um, uh, which is a, uh, a steno occlusive uh, progressive condition, um, can also present with ICH or, or IVH. Um, so primary ICH again is is predominantly made up of hypertension and amyloid. Um, hypertension. What's happening is there are basically chronic changes to the blood vessel uh, where the media and the smooth muscle can degenerate. And as a result, there can be fibrinoid necrosis or formation of small microaneurysms. And these fragile blood, blood vessels can rupture. And, and again, that typically happens in the deep structures, um, including the pons and thalamus and basal ganglia and cerebellum. Um, the other, and that historically and, and still today is really the major cause of primary ICH. In first world countries, um, we, we are seeing over time that within hypertension amyloid, hypertension rates are coming down as we get better at um, controlling blood pressure, but it's still um, the more common uh, source for primary ICH. Um, it's much more common in men. There are some, uh, some racial and ethnic uh, disparities. Globally, uh, the Asian population is most affected by hypertensive ICH, but in the U.S., we see a discrepant uh, representation in the African American um, uh, community. So it, it's it's um, you know it's it's a big problem in the U.S. and abroad, but we're doing a little bit of a better job in the U.S. controlling it. Amyloid is is the other major source of primary ICH, and uh, there are some pictures here. The MRI at the top kind of shows a. Uh, a left, uh, you know, posterior uh, parietal occipital clot, and that kind of low bar location at the you know, more distantly located is characteristic of amyloid. You can also see multiple punctate foci of GRE signal and basically these little micro hemorrhages. And that's because amyloid is really a diffuse process where there's deposition of uh, the beta amyloid protein into the blood vessels throughout. It's not, in, you know, in one specific spot um, like a hypertensive bleed usually occurs. Um, and uh, on the bottom right, you can see the characteristic uh, apple green birefringence uh, staining using immunohistochemistry that you see with amyloid. Um, oftentimes, you, you suspect amyloid, but the diagnosis is not confirmed, really, unless you, you were to go out and take the clot out and, and do tissue staining on the blood vessels. But you can surmise it uh, based on location. It's almost always in older patients, um, and it can be associated with Alzheimer's disease uh, in that the... Uh, apo, uh, one of the apolipoproteins shares a, a genetic lineage to, to the beta amyloid protein. Um, and then finally, a, a major source of primary ICH is, is uh, anticoagulant use, and, and that becomes um, more prominent as uh, with an aging population. Um, this was a, a study out of the Columbia group, you know, looking at primary ICH just to see, you know, in a contemporary analysis, you know, what is, what comprises them. And, and you can see it's mostly still mostly hypertensive ICH, you know, more than, you know, about double the, the representation of total amyloid. And then within the amyloid, it, it, there's, it's not even definite amyloid in all of them, again, because most of these don't have a, a tissue diagnosis. Um, 
Again, an overview looking at um, primary versus secondary. You know, on the left, you can see uh, a thalamic, a hypertensive bleed, um, and those deep structures are preferentially affected here. You can also see it's caused interventricular hemorrhage. Uh, that's an A. Um, if you look over to B, that's a, an example of uh, amyloid angiopathy. C is a, a nice example of a anticoagulant-related uh, IPH, and you can see it's it's large. There's a fluid fluid level, um, and you know those are those are B, we're, we see those more and more commonly these days than in prior generations. Um, and then moving on to a couple different secondary types, so uh, septic emboli, which can happen with um, you know infective endocarditis. Or, or cardiac disease, and again, those preferentially affect the gray-white matter junction. Um, they're usually not round, and there's sort of mixed ischemia on DWI with GRE signal, you know, with hemorrhage. Um, hemorrhagic brain tumor is shown in E, which is um, uh, one of the more common causes of a secondary ICH. And then cavernous malformation is one example of a vascular abnormality, and I'll talk a little bit more about these um, now. So within secondary ICH, um, these are still by far and away, you know, the minority of, of all of ICH. Uh, most ICH is primary. Um, when we look at various causes, um, the most common cause, you know, above any of the um, above any of the vascular abnormalities that that uh, that we get excited about treating are, are hemorrhagic uh, tumors. Um, and th here's a couple examples. There are some pathologies that are more likely than not to have bleeding: um, glioblastoma. Due to its sort of rapid necrosis and 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 uh, and rapid uh, proliferation, uh, renal cell carcinoma is a metastatic lesion that has a propensity towards uh, hemorrhage. Um, and when these hemorrhages occur, they 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 can be silent, they can be you know mildly symptomatic, or they can be urgencies or emergencies depending on how severe they are. In the bottom left, you can see an ependymoma that's had a pretty uh, profound bleed, and you can see the temporal horns of the ventricles that are quite dilated. So this would be, you know, requiring an emergency um, uh, ventriculostomy with or without posterior fossa decompression. So that, you know, it's really, you don't know how bad the hemorrhage will be when it happens. Um, usually surgery is employed for these, one, to, to stabilize the patient and alleviate uh, mass effect, um, and uh, two, for um, achieving a tissue diagnosis. Um, if the clot is small, uh, you can consider allowing some time to let the clot um, resolve or uh, go away a little bit and get better imaging and allow for neurological improvement too. Um, another uh, common cause of secondary ICH is, and probably the second most common behind hemorrhagic tumors, is um, brain arteriovenous malformations or, or AVMs. And um, these comprise about 3% of all uh, ICH. Um, but if you were to look at all of the ICH that we see in younger patients, you know, say 20 to 40 years old, this is by far and away the most common cause of ICH. Um, also in pregnant women, um, we see ICH. When you see ICH in a pregnant woman, um, you want to put AVM much higher in your differential diagnosis than if you were to see it in, you know, a more characteristic patient that's in their 70s or 80s. Um, we classify AVMs based on uh, what's called the Spetzler-Martin grading system, and uh, that basically grades them based on how big they are, whether they're located in eloquent brain, and whether or not the venous drainage is, is deep or not, you know, involving the vena gala and the galenic system. Um, if they're grades one or two, they kind of go into class A, which you can see on the top. And, and we know that, that surgery is actually very, very good for, for that category of AVMs. If they're a grade three AVM, they sort of are in class B, where it's a little bit more unknown and, and really multimodality therapy is, is recommended. And if they're larger and, um, and higher risk, grades four and five, we, ca we categorize them into class C. Um, and we know that the annual risk of rupture ranges from 2.2 to 4.5% from natural history studies. Those numbers are from uh, the Aruba study, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, 2.2, it's lower, obviously, if they don't have a history of rupture. The Columbia group did a nice job showing that there are a couple risk factors that really increase uh, the, the risk of rupture in the natural history, and they're very synergistic. So a deep brain location, deep venous drainage, and an initial hemorrhagic presentation 
when combined can have a, an aggressive natural history with an annual rupture risk of, of close to uh, 36%. So um, we do have some natural history data that helps guide our decision making with AVMs. Um, and, you know, most of these AVMs do present with rupture, you know, as opposed to some of the other vascular malformations uh, or lesions that, you know, more often present with headache or seizure or focal neurologic deficit or even incidentally like aneurysms, um, most AVMs do present with, uh, with hemorrhage. I um, mean, here's some pictures of one. So here's a picture of an AVM, you know, on the brain surface. Um, there's a, an angiogram next to it. And then there's sort of a schematic from one of uh, Mike Lawton's drawings, um, who's, a, who's the, the main cerebrovascular neurosurgeon at the Barrow Neurologic Institute. And, you know, they, they all have very specific anatomy. There are feeding arteries that you can see labeled in red. There's a, you know, a purple nidus, which is like the meat of the AVM. And then uh, they drain, you know, via draining veins, uh, which are usually arterialized. So on the schematic, you can see m other veins are blue, but then there are some purple veins, and those are kind of high flow veins. Um, we, there, are, you know, there are multiple options for what to do when you diagnose these, including when they're ruptured. Uh, one option is observation, and you know, sometimes we don't have a good treatment for them, or sometimes the risk of treatment outweighs the natural history, depending on the patient. Um, another option is surgery, and we usually do surgery with or without preoperative embolization. Um, we usually do surgery for grades one to two and in select uh, grade three AVMs. What's important to note is in the United States, it's very, very uncommon to use endovascular embolization as a sole treatment modality. Um, this is very popular in Europe, and usually that involves going transvenous, and they call it sort of the pressure cooker technique, and that's uh, where you kind of arrest flow and, and try to fill up the draining vein in a retrograde fashion, um, it is very risky, and that is uh, part of the reason that the results of the Aruba showed what it did, and I'll talk about that in, in I think, the next slide. Uh, but so we really think about endovascular embolization with AVMs at this center and almost every center in the U.S. as an adjunct to either doing surgery or radiosurgery, with the exception of what we call a palliative embolization. So if a patient has really bad pulsatile tinnitus and they have a grade five AVM that we just can't treat, occasionally we will offer a palliative embolization where we can try to reduce flow just to you know, improve the quality of life while they're alive, but knowing that it's, it, it can be quite risky. And then certainly won't cure, cure the AVM in most cases. Uh, and then finally, radio surgery is an option. Um, the, the caveat with radio surgery obviously being that you don't see an immediate effect. You, you usually see it anywhere from two to five years down the road after um, delivering the radio surgery. Um, so there was a, a randomized trial called Aruba um, that uh, compared medical management to, um, to any sort of intervention for unruptured AVMs. And uh, the trial showed that there were, um, there was a higher, uh, the, the higher rates of stroke uh, and complication or morbidity, which were their primary outcomes, in the um, in the in the intervention group compared to the medical group, um, this trial was met with a lot of resistance and isn't really accepted by a lot of contemporary interventionalists for AVMs in the United States for a number of reasons. Um, number one is the follow-up was very short. It was I think it was about 14 months, and so whereas. They, it accounted for all of the risk and complications that you get with treating an AVM because you take all of that risk up front. If you do a surgery on someone, all the risk basically comes from that, you know, day zero event. Um, it only went out, you know, just over a year. And so the whole medical group, the whole aim was to characterize, well, what's the lifetime risk of not doing anything about this? You know, what's the natural history? So it, it completely whiffed on capturing the natural history of AVMs in the sense that it just didn't, didn't uh, track the patients out uh, far enough. The other big criticism is this was an international study, so it included a lot of centers in Europe who, who do what I talked about, a sole endovascular treatment for AVMs, which we don't do in the United States. Um, and that, that when you lump all treatments in together, including radiosurgery, where the AVM's not removed um, you know, immediately, again, you haven't given the patients long enough for, to, to see the benefit of a, of a radiosurgery operation, and it's a totally different thing to do radiosurgery than to do surgery. So it sort of lumped all interventions 
um, for AVMs uh, into one one collective bin, and so that was that's obviously met with resistance from people who specialize in all of the interventions. I mean, I think the people who do radio surgery would want to study those patients independently, and patients who do surgery, you know, would want to study those patients independently just because they're different interventions. Um, and then finally, there was um, there was a very high hemorrhage rate in all of the treatments. Um, and that alluded to the notion that maybe there are different skill sets. We know that the Europeans are really talented in endovascular treatment, despite it being much riskier for AVMs, but the microsurgical training is very different in the United States and more rigorous. Um, that's not to say that there aren't good surgeons in both the US and, and Europe, but it's just, it's hard when you use uh, multiple surgical providers. You'll see a lot of single surgeon series because there's a lot that goes into surgical technique and, and differences with complication rates and stuff. Um, moving on with AVMs, you know, what, what makes them different from other sources of ICH? And, and one of the incredible things is that the, both the mortality and the morbidity are much better with patients who have ruptured AVM ICH if you compare it to normal spontaneous ICH. So if you look at the, you know, the rate of, of uh, mortality, it's, it's, it's about half when you account for all the other, you know, these are younger patients. So in general, the mortality is going to be much lower. But when you account for all that stuff and just compare ICH to ICH and multivariate modeling, the risk of mortality is about half. And the risk of going home is double. So the you know the the rates of functional independence and the morbidity is much lower uh, with patients that have uh, ruptured AVMs. Another uh, vascular malformation is called the cavernous malformation or CAVMALS. Um, these represent uh, a smaller number of uh, overall secondary ICH, about 1%. Um, we call these kind of low flow lesions in that, whereas with AVMs you have an artery plugging in to a nidus and then, you know, an abnormal vein. These are, these are almost like uh, very low-grade tumors of, of a vein or something. We call them, they look like mulberries, and they're kind of chronically oozing or bleeding. If you, they're oftentimes, they don't most, they most commonly present um, with, uh, with seizures. They don't present as commonly with a large symptomatic ICH. On the bottom, you can see that they can present like that, and they certainly can have large ICHs, but they kind of are chronically oozing lesions that more often we detect either because of seizures or headaches or incidentally as opposed to rupture. Um, only 30% present with ICH, and usually it's some sort of subacute blood. So you can see in the top, it, it's, it's almost hard to detect if you just were to look at the CT scan or MRI fast. Um, the risk of rupture is much lower than with uh, brain AVMs. Um, unless they've had a recent bleed, then the risk of rupture can be higher. Um, and also brainstem lesions, we know from, from uh, studying them, do have a, a worse natural history. They, they can bleed more often. Typically for these, the, you know, the first line is observation or, or medically trying to control the seizures. If they're having repeat events, um, then usually we consider surgery for these. Um, another form of uh, secondary ICH is due to dural AV fistulas. Um, so these are different than AVMs in that um, there's no nidus. So whereas that last picture, you can see there's a feeding artery, a nidus, and a draining vein, here there's really one fistulous point, usually in the wall of one of the venous sinuses and in the dura, um, between usually a meningeal artery, but there can be peel ones, to either a dural venous sinus or a cortical vein. Um, these are usually acquired lesions, whereas AVMs are thought to be you know, you're kind of like congenital, um, not 100% of the cases, but most AVMs are congenital. And then here, there's usually some sort of a history of a trauma or an infection or a thrombosis. Um, they represent about 10 to 15% of all craniovascular malformations, but again, only about 1% of ICH. These are dynamic lesions. You know, I'm particularly interested in them. They they change. They can recruit new arterial sources. They can, the venous drainage can change. Um, they, they present in, in all sorts of ways. Um, incidentally, with rupture, uh, pulsatile tinnitus is sort of the common symptom. Um, and then they, you can also have papilledema or, uh, non, or a non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit. Um, Here's a picture of one. Um, we Again, they don't have a nidus. They have usually one fistulous point in the wall of the sinus. There are multiple grading systems. We most commonly use the Borden grade, uh, where you, know, you can see a grade one here, where the, flow, the, the fistula occurs in the wall of a sinus. 
and then the flow goes anterograde down the sinus. Um, so that is the lowest risk lesion because flow is going in the right direction, but they can be symptomatic with pulsatile tinnitus. A type two, uh, and these can change grade, you know, from one to another. A type two is again, the fistulous point is in the wall of the sinus, but now instead of going anterograde, you know, down the jugular vein, it, it actually goes in reverse. Maybe because over time, the sinus in response to the high flow proliferates and then eventually occludes. But for whatever reason, now flow is going backwards. And you can see in this case, there's a cortical vein, the vena labae, that is now seen high flow. So that's where you start to you know, introduce potentially a higher risk of rupture because now you have a cortical vein, which is more fragile than a sinus that's seen higher flow. And then finally, there's a grade three lesion. You know, and here you can see one, and those drain directly into a cortical vein. So we call that direct cortical venous drainage. And those are the highest risk uh, for rupture when they do happen. But overall, you know, these dural AV fistulas have a lower risk of rupture than other uh, vascular malformations. And Greg Ziffel, who's the chair of neurosurgery at Wash U, has done a really nice job um, further characterizing their natural history. You know, we used to kind of think that all grade twos and grade threes had a, had a high risk of ICH, and it's actually not the case. It has a lot to do with whether or not they're symptomatic or not. And, and he showed nicely here with his group that asymptomatic grade twos and threes, still the ICH risk is, is low. It's there, but, um, but it's low. And you can think of those sorts of treatment as, you know, elective. Um, uh, Dr. Ziffel also kind of formed a consortium that, um, that, um, that, I, that I was fortunate to be a part of when I was in training called Condor. And I'll show some of the data that's coming out from that. But it's a nice way to study what is otherwise a very rare disease and try to understand natural history or treatment trends. Um, dural AV fistulas can be treated sort of by, by, all, you know, by the whole arsenal. So we can treat them microsurgically. And when I say microsurgically, there's, there's various ways that you can approach that. You can clip or cauterize the draining vein, which is the most common microsurgical. You can actually resect the piece of dura uh, that has the fistula. If it's not in a major sinus, obviously that's important. And then, you know, if the fistula occurs into like a large sinus that you need to keep, you know, you can't exactly put a clip on it. So in those cases, you need to kind of skeletonize it. So there's an array of microsurgical treatment. By far and away, the, 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 the primary treatment is endovascular. You know, as opposed to AVMs, we treat AV fistulas, dural AV fistulas, almost exclusively today very safely and effectively with, uh, with endovascular modality. And you can use various techniques within endovascular. You can embolize using coils, glue, or onyx, and probably a liquid embolic, like glue or onyx are the most common and most effective. And you can do this on the arterial side of things, doing transarterial, or you can do it um, transvenous. Um, and then finally, radiosurgery is also an option, um, particularly in patients who have a lot of comorbidities. And, and won't tolerate uh, surgery. This is an example of a published uh, case of an of a fistula. You can see, looking at B and C, that you know th there's both right and left sided ECA branches, like the superficial temporal artery and the middle meningeal artery, that plug directly into a cortical vein. So it actually plugs into a vein, which then goes into the sinus. So it's a very high risk lesion. You can see it presented with with a with ICH. And here you can see on the bottom in E, once you've done an embolization, either with glue or, or onyx, um, you can usually see the, the mold that that liquid, you know, it's like cement or, or glue or, or super glue or something. And you can kind of push it through and your goal is to occlude the draining vein, um, which is your goal surgically. So if you were to treat this surgically, instead of using a liquid embolic to cast the draining vein, you would open everything up and put a clip across the draining vein. Um, and this is a, a, something that came out this past week that uh, both uh, Dale, who you know, my partner and I are, are co-authors on, is part of the Condor Consortium. But um, it, it was very relevant to this talk because they actually tried to do what that AVM paper had done, which is to say, well, what are the outcomes of patients who have a ruptured dural AV fistula, and how does that compare to ICH? And and it's incredible. The the poor outcome is only observed in 17% of cases. You know, it's 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 probably you know close to 40 or 50%. And I, I mean, one-year mortality is, is approaches 50% with ICH, spontaneous ICH. And here, it's, 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 uh, the mortality is only 3.6%. So it's significantly better, even than the AVMs, um, to be honest. So it's important to study these secondary causes of ICH. And I think the reason, 
as neurosurgeons or interventional neurologists or interventional neuroradiologists, we get excited about treating these, even though they're rare, is we, we've kind of seen it anecdotally, and now it's starting to pan out on larger studies that the outcomes are significantly better. Um, so what does hemorrhagic stroke at the University of Louisville look like? And again, I have to thank the stroke research team for helping me pull some of these numbers. These are, this is um, using the, um, one of the uh, registries we have from the ULH Get With the Guidelines. And uh, this looks at uh, various years, and you can see the volume of ischemic stroke that we see versus ICH versus subarachnoid hemorrhage. So just to put things in perspective, um, ischemic stroke is so much more of, of what we see as stroke, and you can kind of see that depicted here. Whereas you might, we might see on average around 700 ischemic stroke at, at ULH, you know, really we're seeing in the, in the ballpark of, you know, 130 to 140 or, you know, this year maybe 170 ICHs. And, and, all, and both of those kind of giant over subarachnoid hemorrhage or aneurysms. Um, on the bottom, you, so for all of these for 2021, we only have data for five months. So I sort of extrapolated if we stayed on that rate, what we would achieve by the end of the year. In the top right, you can see, um, again, a pie graph showing that about 20% of 2021 volume of overall stroke will be ICH. If you look at national databases like the national inpatient sample and and that's and below you can see that data pulled from a paper from 2010 to 2015 you know it, it it even is higher here at ulh than we see nationally you know nationally ich is really only comprising eight to nine percent of the total uh, stroke and you know same with subarachnoid hemorrhage it's it's even lower nationally than compared here so ischemic stroke is still obviously the biggest player you know, if we look at how severe uh, do patients present with ICH versus subarachnoid hemorrhage, and again, this is all data from ULH, if we look at all of the presentations, you know, ICH is graded differently than subarachnoid hemorrhage, but, you know, it, there's an ICH score that you can compute that ranges from zero to six, and while you can't compare, you know, a grade three ICH to a grade, you know, Hunt Hess grade three in subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, it still at least gives some sort of a stratification system, and if you look the numbers and the grades are actually the same from pie chart to pie chart. They're, they're, they're actually very similar, you know, like about 75% present with something from grade zero or one to grade three, um, you know, within its respective uh, classification system. But if you look at the overall disposition now at U of L of all the ICH compared to subarachnoid hemorrhage, there is an incredible disproportionate uh, representation of poor outcomes in ICH compared to SAH. And if you look at almost half of patients die, and this is discharge, this isn't, you know, one year outcomes. Whereas in subarachnoid hemorrhage, by far and away, the most of patients are going home, you know, after, after treatment. Um, so they're very different diseases. And although ICH, um, you know, we have so much more cases of it in subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can see that outcomes are, are really poor. Um, this is not just at ULH, you know, this, this is all published, you know, nationally and globally. Um, if we look at readmissions for patients, again, stratifying based on type of stroke, um, here you can see ICH is orange on the left graph. The readmissions are highest with ICH, you know, even compared to acute stroke. I mean, there's like eight times the patients that are admitted with acute ischemic stroke and still ICH patients take the lead in, in readmissions, which is which is really incredible. So it's not just an issue of initial triage and treatment, but the patients are then coming back. You know, we're not doing a good job at, at, at post-hospitalization care. Um, within that same group, they looked at, you know, does it make a difference of whether you're at a teaching institution or not? Um, and you can see it does if you're high enough volume. So if your annual stroke volume, as it grows up on the y-axis, there's a huge discrepancy and I think that makes total sense. It, you know, the centers that are not teaching centers are probably not as well equipped as a teaching center at handling high volumes of, of, of stroke patients. They, they're, they're obviously so complicated to both treat up front, but then to manage them afterwards. And you can see um, the readmission rate is really high in non-teaching hospitals that do a high volume of stroke. Um, this was the Rotterdam study out of the Netherlands, and a lot of what we know about outcomes in, in ICH, you know, comes from this. And, and again, it, 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 this is, I think, uh, this is survival probability. So you got to flip it for mortality. But if you look over at the left, you know, for hemorrhagic stroke, the mortality at one year was, is, is 66%. And at three years, the mortality, I mean, this isn't a poor outcome. We're talking about death 
is 73%, whereas in ischemic stroke, it's, it's much better. The mortality at, at one year is only 24%. Um, if we look over time, is that changing? Uh, so if you look over at the right, you can see that the overall volume of hemorrhagic stroke um, has been fairly stable, actually. If you look at the deaths of hemorrhagic stroke, they've been increasing a little bit. If you look at ischemic stroke, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more ischemic stroke deaths. But if you look at the bottom at D, there's actually a statistically significant trend down for ischemic stroke death rate. So we're doing a much better job at keeping ischemic stroke patients alive. However, on the left to that, you can see for hemorrhagic stroke, over the same time span, we have not made any difference in the mortality for hemorrhagic stroke. And as you might expect, there's a tremendous cost difference that you see for patients um, in that a hospitalization, let alone post-operative care, for a, a standard patient with ICH is, is almost double that of what an ischemic stroke hospitalization. So obviously, that's going to be quite taxing on the health system. So sort of all of this, you know, the really good outcomes with AVMs or dural AV fistulas, the discrepancy between ICH kind of sets the stage, like, is there something that we can do, um, you know, differently for these patients? I mean, there's obviously a huge need. It's more deadly than other forms of stroke, and that mortality is, you know, over 50% at one year. It's expensive. Um, there's longer length of stay in the hospital. That's a, a large driver of it being expensive. And then it's just more morbid than, than secondary causes, where, you know, only a, a third of patients will, will achieve um, functional independence of the surviving cohort. Um, so what do the guidelines say? I think anytime you're reviewing a topic, it's important to know before what's what's on the horizon, you know, what, what what are the guidelines that we currently have? And I encourage everyone to to look at this for this. There's also great AHA ASA guidelines for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but you know, the, the, this is obviously a group of of experts that review not only all the data that's out there, but how good the data is. So you know, they'll use this this um, uh, this system that I that's shown here with all the colors, you know, to to grade the class of evidence and then the level of evidence. Um, and in class one evidence, the benefit significantly outweighs the risk, whereas on the other side, it's harmful. And on the y-axis, you see, you know, how, how large the, the, the data set is and, and how strong the recommendation is. Um, so the guidelines, which are a little bit outdated in that they came out in 2015, there's been a lot of movement in this field since there, um, really suggest primary medical management for ICH. Um, you know, for most supertentorial ICH, the usefulness of surgery is not well established. And, you know, for supertentorial spontaneous ICH, because obviously infratentorial is more life-threatening because the brainstem is there, surgery may be considered for deteriorating patients as a life-saving measure. So that's what the, the and, and, and what I wanted to do next is transition to, you know, where did the data for these guidelines come from? And, and when we think of quote-unquote surgery, for ICH, kind of as represented in the guidelines here, what does that really mean? And so, part of the part of the, it, 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 I think, is central to this paradigm is understanding that surgery is continuing to evolve for the better, uh, for all for all forms, but really for ICH in particular. So, when the main trials came out, I'll review all of those trials shortly. Stitch looking at surgery for ICH, quote unquote surgery. Really, what they were talking about was doing a craniotomy for decompression of the brain with or without clot evacuation. So here you can see um, you know, on the top, a craniotomy. So they've taken the bone off. You can see a picture of the dura open. There's the clot. There's a sucker. You suck the clot out, and they put the bone back. So this is a craniotomy for clot evacuation. On the bottom, you can see a craniectomy uh, with clot evacuation, too. So here the bone's taken off. You know, the, the brain is transgressed. The clot is evacuated. And they actually left the bone off to, to still leave Decompression. This is an incredibly useful, life-saving tool that we still do, but it's not really how people are treating ICH these days. And this is what those guidelines um, are largely based on with Stitch. The next stage of surgical intervention for ICH, which is really what was captured in the MISTI data, is what we call stereotactic aspiration. And this is still a passive, quote unquote, or you know, first-generation form of uh, clot evacuation. So here, instead of doing a craniotomy, where a burr hole is made, stealth neuronavigation is used to pass a catheter into the clot, and it 
sometimes it's aspirated, sometimes it's not. You can't really see the clot, so you have no idea what's going on. And then usually TPA is given at the end to kind of promote it, you know, draining out and coming out. And again, this is this was you know the next phase of surgery uh, that was that was used. And again, we don't do this at all anymore. But this is the guidelines that that I just presented are based exclusively on these two modalities. So what's what's the newer age or you know second or third generation of clot evacuation? So these are really the the minimally invasive techniques, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on these or what we call active clot evacuation. So in these, not only are we taking the clot out, not only are we doing it minimally invasively, but we're actually looking to see how effective we're doing it, either with an endoscope or with a tubular retractor or so something so that it's not a blind, either sticking a catheter in or sucking things out. We have a sense of how effective we're being. So the major, um, and we do this here, the major, the major form of, end of uh, minimally invasive or active clot evacuation is using the endoscope or endoscope assisted. Um, and here's what that looks like. So this is done with a, an incision above the eyebrow on the forehead, um, a small burr hole. And that's just done because the endoscope is ideally placed along the long axis of the clot. So here you can see the endoscope going through the frontal lobe into the clot. And then there are different endoscopes that are out there. On the top is Penumbra is a company that makes uh, endoscopes. The first generation was called Apollo, and now the second generation is shown in B, and that's called Artemis. And so that's what we actually have here, and that's what a lot of places use. Um, through that Artemis endoscope, you can put, there's a port for irrigation, there's a port for suction, and you can put an instrument through to try to suck and break up the clot. Um, on the bottom is another, form of endoscope called the Integra Surgiscope. Um, and, and you have, to, you can't give a talk about this stuff and not, you know, identify the group at Sinai and Chris Kellner, who's a neurosurgeon at Sinai, who is really trying to push this field forward. I mean, this is, you know, like the defining thing over there. And he's done a lot of work uh, showing endoscopic clot evacuation and the benefits of it. And I'll show some of that data, but here's another picture kind of showing just how endoscopic works. You, you, ha you have a small burr hole, you, pace, you place the endoscope along the long axis of the clot, and you're able to directly visualize it as you take it out. And ideally, you kind of take it out from back to front so that the brain kind of collapses around it. And, and you know, you're ultimately able to evacuate a, a good amount of the clot. Another major form of MIS or, you know, third generation active clot evacuation is called endoport. So that's where you use like a little, um, almost like a speculum into the, into the brain. And that is called transulcal also. And the major company that's supported that and made devices for that is called Nico. And Nico makes these, again, these little retractors that you place using stealth. And, and on the left side, you can see B, one of the retractors is in place and it gives you a little port all the way down into the clot. This requires more than a burr hole, usually a, a little craniotomy. And it's also different than um, endoscopic in that if you look over it on the right side, these actually go transulcal. And so for the longest time, you know, we were, neurosurgeons were always taught to really avoid going through a sulcus of the brain. And the reason is that there, are, there there's a lot of blood vessels that live at the depth. So, you know, we, we were always instructed, stay away from the sulci, you know, open the brain up top where you can see everything. And then, you know, you're not gonna get into some sort of a blood vessel. This was a little bit provocative in that sense, and that what they were trying to do was show that you're actually doing the best, you're doing the patient good by going through the sulcus, as long as you can visualize the blood vessels, because you're only interrupting the U fibers. So you see the U fibers highlighted in blue there, as opposed to the major white matter tracts, um, you know, like the arcuate fasciculus or superior longitudinal fasciculus, which are highlighted in purple. Um, so this transulcal approach is kind of inherent to the endoport. Uh, and then finally, I didn't talk about spontaneous IVH, but there's a whole, you know, data out there on the clear IVH trial showing that treating IVH does improve outcomes. But um, within IVH, there, there's also MIS um, active uh, devices that are new. Um, so here's an example of the Iraflow, which is sort of a dual lumen catheter that allows you to both drain bloody spinal fluid, but also, you know, irrigate it out. Um, so... This is a summary slide looking at the, the clinical trials that we have so far in ICH. And I'll go into more details for them, but you know, again, think about stitch is mostly focusing on craniotomy. There were some patients that had stereotactic aspiration, but really it was predominantly craniotomy in, in, in over 70% of the cases. And then MISTI was you know, minimally invasive, not 
what I just showed you minimally invasive, but that stereotactic um, aspiration technique where you're not visualizing clot evacuation. So um, I'll briefly kind of go through each of these. Stitch was the first uh, study that, that came out uh, looking at spontaneous ICH. Um, it was a landmark study in that, you know, it was, it was class one data, perspective, random, randomized control trial, and, and they showed that there was no difference um, between surgery and conservative, an initial conservative management. Um, there were some drawbacks. The median time to surgery was 30 hours, which is which may be too long. We don't have a good answer, um, and I'll talk about the timing to surgery in a second. But it was it was it was a little bit delayed for for what we normally do as surgeons for for large ICHs. And while there was no difference overall, uh, there was a subgroup that 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 maybe alluded to showing a better outcome for superficially based lesions. So this grouped superficial and deep lesions. Um, the numbers were good, you know, it, it, the, the, it was 500, you know, over 500 patients in each subgroup, in each, uh, in each, uh, group, um, and, uh, and here are the inclusion criteria and et cetera. Um, again, the controversies were that most patients, about 77% were treated with craniotomy. Um, there was significant crossover and the time was, was, was late, you know, the trial was almost described better as surgical removal of ICH at 30 hours, um, and, and it was really at the discretion of the treating investigator. So it still left a lot of questions open um, for, you know, whether or not surgery played a role. Um, Stitch 2 did a nice job tightening up the time interval. So um, they aimed to uh, randomize patients uh, within uh, 12 hours, um, as opposed to that longer 24 hours, which ended up being surgery at 30 hours. Um, and similarly had, had good numbers. Again, there was sort of a subgroup uh, that demonstrated a benefit. Um, if the clot was superficial uh, without interventricular extension um, and uh, with poor prognosis. So there were some patients that benefited. Um, at this point, people were starting to move towards minim more minimally invasive things exclusively. And so that set the stage for uh, MISTI, um, which did, which, you know, MISTI won, a, alluded to an advantage that the problem with this is that the numbers were low. So there was only 96 patients, so it wasn't really powered to show a significant uh, change. And MISTI 2, unfortunately, kind of still had the same issue in that the numbers were low, but both of these were alluding to the fact that this minimally invasive technique was safe um, and, uh, and, and, and improved outcome, uh, particularly uh, in, in superficially located clot cohorts. Um, so MISTI-3 is sort of the most recent trial that came out. And um, although the overall, overall there was no statistically significant difference in the surgical group versus the medical care group. However, there was a trend and there were some groups that did benefit. And then we learned a lot from the trial about how to design uh, subsequent trials. So um, these are the results. And the, the main group that seemed to benefit uh, were the patients that if you got the clot volume to lower to than 15 cc's after surgery, there was a 10% increase that was significant in improving outcomes. So, you know, again, this was mostly using stereotactic aspiration. This was not using these, these newer techniques, but, you know, even here where they started to quantify residual clot volume, they started to see, well, you know, if you actually systematically do a good job with your clot evacuation, there is actually a difference. And I think there's a really good commentary by Alex Biota, who's at MUSC, um, that, that looked at this and said, even though, you know, people are calling it a, a failure and showing a statistically significant um, difference in the groups, it really is a success. And the reasons why are, one, ICH evacuation was found to be safe. You know, we know ICH, the natural history is terrible. And you know, I just showed you all these numbers showing that the mortality is so bad and functional dependence is terrible. So at least doing the procedure isn't making it worse, which sometimes it does. So it's good to know that. Secondly, there was a benefit in mortality. It didn't achieve statistical significance, but you know, mortality was reduced by 7%, which is a start. It's not you know, an, an incredible change, but it's, it's definitely an improvement from the status quo, although it wasn't statistical. And then finally, um, there was a statistically significant functional improvement in this select group where the clot evacuation was, uh, was successful. You know, how many patients actually got less than 15 cc's achieved is only 58 percent um, this is a trial that should finish up that's sponsored by nico that transsocal um, endoport group and it's based out of emory and you know they're they're looking to really only use that transsocal approach so i think these 
the newer trials are going to be very specific on using one technology or another and are going to define you know effectiveness of clot evacuation better and I'm, and I'm hopeful that we'll have some more information kind of guiding the role of surgery in ICH. Um, how does ICH nationally with surgery look you know d with all this data taken have we seen any any trends and so this is courtesy of uh, Beatrice who's uh, a professor, uh, a uh, um, associate professor in our department, um, who, who does a lot of analysis using MarketScan, which is a, a database um, that collects um, uh, information on hospitalization data based on insurance, and so you can you can analyze um, various CPT codes and ICD codes. So I asked her to to look, you know, from 2000 2019. You know, with these trials and these studies and these new technologies, and maybe 2019 isn't late enough. You know, I think that that third wave of minimally invasive has really taken off in the past two years. But you know, what do things look like? So if you look at the total ICH, it's actually come down, and that's consistent with <clears throat> what I talked about earlier, and that we've been much better at controlling hypertension. Um, if you look at the surgery rate, though, it's it's steadily declining. You know, it has not. It, there hasn't been any uptick nationally, at least through 2019. I, I do think if we had more up-to-date data, you would see in the past two years that those numbers have gone up and, and that people are being more aggressive despite the recommendations, you know, which, which don't suggest doing so. Um, this is an editorial by Chris Kellner, the, the guy from Sinai um, and his team. Um, and, it, and it's an interesting notion that I, I don't know how I feel about it, um, but, you know, I, I think it's controversial and, and, and he is, is so motivated to, to look at this. His, you know, his whole point in this is the same way that we think about taking out an epidural hematoma or doing a mechanical thrombectomy where time is brain and the sooner that you can do it, the better. There is no reason that secondary injury from ICH is any different. You know, sure, if you have a, a, a huge primary injury to the basal ganglia or the thalamus and there's a poor exam, maybe the secondary injury is more mass, but that doesn't change the fact that we should be you know, treating these, you know, hyper acutely. And that's what they do at Sinai. These are, these are like, like ischemic strokes. They basically take them emergently for a clot evacuation in a biplane suite and they do CT scans until they achieve, you know, less than 15 cc's of clot evacuation. I, they have re decent data that supports it. it. It's just sort of a controversial thought. Um, they've also, you know, done meta-analyses to look at timing and, and it pans out. You know, if they look at all of the studies out there using newer age technology and they and they compare it to conventional craniotomy. So first of all, there is definite data that if you do either endoscopic, which is what they do and most people do, or transtubular, that you have at least twice the rate of better outcomes from doing a craniotomy or, or a uh, or an, uh, stereotactic aspiration of the clot. So that's very interesting, you know, that, that these new technologies um, like endoscopic, you know, definitely are effective and they're more effective than um, conventional surgery. And then secondly, they looked at timing. And so they looked at within 24 hours as opposed to within 72 hours. And similarly, they see, you know, almost, almost double the rate of, of good outcomes. Um, this is their group publishing um, what their outcomes are and then comparing it to MISTI. So their, their data is on the blue. And you can see, you know, if you look at the way bottom for all Sinai patients, you know, it's not 50% mortality with, you know, 10% of patients having a good outcome. It's like 75% of patients, you know, coming, having an MRS of zero to three at six months. It's, it's really good outcomes. If they cross compare their cohort, you know, who would have been MISTI eligible, it's a much smaller cohort because MISTI had a lot of exclusion criteria. So MISTI, they had to wait in order to get a second CT scan, whereas at Sinai, as long as the CTA is negative, they don't wait for the hemorrhage to stabilize radiographically. They just go and take it out because they know they can buzz whatever the offending agent is. And you can see it's vastly different than MISTI, where you know 25% of patients had an MRS from zero to three. And again, I, I want to highlight that they're, part of the reason is they're looking at how many of their patients get to less than 15 cc's of blood after, and, and it's 86% you know, instead of 58%. Um, so I'll wrap up there. In conclusion, um, ICH uh, represents about 9% of stroke. It's higher at University of Louisville and closer to 20%. Um, the primary causes are the most common, which are hypertension, which we're doing a better job nationally about controlling, but is still more than double the, the cause of amyloid, and then anticoagulant related. And anticoagulant related is becoming more and more common. I think these primary ICH are the ones that are most common and the ones that we really should focus our efforts on. Secondary causes generally have better outcomes. That's what, you know, 
eye and, and, and the neurosurgeons specialize in, at least historically. Um, but uh, but I think there's a better worked out paradigm already for you know what to do with these. We have we certainly aren't perfect, but we have a pretty good sense of how to ap approach these in interdisciplinary treatment plans with with radiation oncologists, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have the natural history worked out, and they're all very different. Um, but you know we have more answers on on what to do for them. Mortality, morbidity, readmission, and cost of primary ICH are disproportionately higher than ischemic stroke or other forms of hemorrhagic stroke. And I think that's the big takeaway that I want that I want people to know from the talk today. Um, and I think that motivates a very big need for trying to improve outcomes, either with faster surgical remover, uh, removal through MIS techniques, um, which really aren't captured in the trial data that we have in STITCH or MISTI. Um, th and then finally, just on a technical uh, sense, the two main, you know, new age, third generation surgical techniques can be grouped into either endoscopic techniques with Artemis, which is what we do, which is what Mount Sinai does, and then, or, you know, transsulcal or tubular, which is by the NICO company. And that's something, that trial, the enriched trial, we should have the data by the end of the year. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Dr. Remmel for inviting me um, and the whole neuro uh, neurology department, Jason Stiles, uh, Lisa Taylor, Tina Walsh, who are great in, su in supplying that uh, very specific U of L data. Uh, Beatrice uh, in, in our department, who, who's also been fantastic and helped with the cost data from MarketScan. Um, Troy Gardner, who's on the sales end of NICO and is just very motivated by ICH in general and, and supplied some, some of the data and slides. And Kim Meyer, who's a nurse practitioner, works with me, who also helped with the slides. And here's my contact info, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions if there are any. First of all, thank you very much. I appreciate this, I think we all appreciate this wonderful overview. And um, it it is interesting that we have such a large number of ICHs, um, but being a comprehensive stroke center, we get quite a few transfers in from other hospitals, from our own system, but from other systems around the region. And I think we might see that in the academic comprehensive stroke centers compared to the uh, nationwide uh, data. Uh, but of course, this tells us that we need to come up with <laughs> uh, better approaches and we need to engage in the research and be leaders in research in, uh, in ICH. One other little, just small point I want to make is that I think J.P. Moore may be following those patients in Aruba for five years, so it'll be interesting. Definitely. I haven't seen the final on that, but no. uh, that would be interesting to look at. Thank you very much, it was great. Of course, thanks. Josh, I, I think that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on the need for intraoperative imaging for clot evacuation, because of, you know this, this goal to get down to 15 cc's is, is it's sometimes hard to tell. Uh, yeah, so so that's it's funny on our call yesterday. That's what sort of motivated that um, that idea. So I know at University of Washington, where we use Artemis and we do it endoscopically, we use a serotome. We we use the serotome for every case, and and there's no other way to know that <clears throat> you you've done it enough. Um, an intraoperative MRI could could do the same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. At uh, at Sinai, they do them all in a biplane suite. And, and sorry, in a in a uh, hybrid room, and I think that they do a diagnostic angiogram on all of them as well, um, right before they've had a couple CT. They had they just do so many there that they had a couple CTA negative like a small AVMs that ended up causing a big problem when you have an endoscope in. Obviously, an AVM is not a situation you want to be in, but um, so they do it all in a hybrid room. Um, and that's their workflow. There's a couple other places that do the same thing. I think intraoperative imaging is 100% essential to doing these. I don't think the, the alternative would be to leave the room sterile, close everything up, take the patient to MR or CT, keeping the room sterile, and then bring them back if you're committed to doing it right. And, you know, I hadn't delved into the data this deep until I, had, you know, was asked for this talk. But I, but I do think that if you're going to do it, you might as well, you know, do it do it the right way. And so I know we're in discussions of potentially acquiring an, uh, a portable MRI scanner 
And I imagine it would be able to do the same exact thing and, you know, with less radiation, but, but I do think it's essential. I, I, I don't, um, otherwise you just don't know. And, 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 you know, I, at UW, maybe I saw 10%, you know, you reopened and, and took more clot out and it's really not, it's just a small incision. So it don't, the reopening, you leave everything sterile. It only, it takes about 10 minutes before you're back into the clot if you have a good workflow set up. So I, I do think it's, it's really essential if you're going to do it and you're going to buy into it. And I, and I think there's enough reason to do it and buy into it. Do you have a sense of how many, I mean, I think we do this sometimes at our institution. We're not doing it consistently. Do, you know, do you have I haven't done any, any, yeah, I haven't done any since I arrived. Dale has done, I want to say two in the past uh, two months. I mean, we keep a lookout for it. It's not, it, the some of the ICH we see just isn't a good isn't a good candidate or you know they say to there there's a whole movement to even do this for IVH but the 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 teaching is to kind of start with the ones that don't have IVH just to get you know your your um, it's a whole there's a whole technique and technical skill set to it and, and like using an endoscope that's buried in a lot of blood and trying to see stuff and um, so so I think that there there um, for whatever reason in the past two months I don't think there's been uh, that many I think Dale's done two in the past two months though um, we're, we're we're always happy to do them if they come up and we try to keep our eye out you know another thing is this is another reason for um, and another tool that might capture more uh, of these is to use rapid has an ICH um, you know rapid is building an aneurysm protocol which I think we're going to trial um, but also uh, an ICH uh, code that, that can detect ICH at various hospitals. And, you know, I think the future is, is really going to be contingent on systems like RAPID where surgeons or interventionalists can kind of be surveying image and let outside ED docs. I, I think the classic teaching is that surgery is not the answer for these. So I think it's probably quite common for outside centers to hold on to these and think, well, there's, you know, what are they going to do? The patient's, you know, this, or, you know, they've, they've had this hemorrhagic stroke. They're not herniating, so they don't need an emergency surgery. But I think as these the new trials come out, we'll be more informed, but then also as new imaging uh, and software platforms come out, we'll be able to capture more patients, you know, at, at, a, at spoken hub, you know, in a spoken hub model. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I, I think the data from Sinai is interesting. I, I think there is a bit of fatigue among neurosurgeons. We've had so many studies and, and they've just not, they haven't quite crossed that boundary of, hey, we really should be doing this. And so the fact that, you know, in that graph that you showed that it's sort of tailing off into 2019 doesn't surprise yeah. me too much, but it, it is possible that if we sort of rethink it or have better diagnostic tools or better intraoperative tools, we could kind of shift that and, and, and convince people that it's worthwhile. I would be interested to explore. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for a great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you.